approved in the first instance, and now we have the, the court review for the, the remaining portion, and we're seeing that eight out of 11, at least, of those are, are resulting in the outcome that, that, that works for the debtors. Um, in terms of the, the, the other issues raised, and, and the, again, the so-called vulture funds, um, it is fair to say that the legislation that we now have protecting debtors in the, in the sphere of personal insolvency goes beyond that which exists in, in all other common law jurisdictions. So where vulture funds uh, arrive, and let's say it's the first time that they've bought a loan book, um, there is a learning curve. So we do, as a, as a matter of course, as soon as we become aware of, of their sort of activity here, contact them to make them aware of the protections that are there for debtors and what the operation of our insolvency uh, legislation means for them. And once we have had that engagement, uh, there, there, there is a respect for that, uh, and certainly they would respect the, the protective certificate which stops those uh, lenders from making contact with the debtor. Um, we would have had instances where, unbeknownst to them, they continue to make contact unaware that actually the legislation prevents them from doing so, but once we've told them, we're not aware of instances where they would continue to breach that. Is it on that point, Deputy Cummins? Yeah. When Please. the vulture funds buy distressed mortgages or whatever, a book, and say the majority of those mortgages would be about 300 grand at the top of the range of the, the, of the boom, and they buy it at half the price, do you negotiate on the, what they buy, buy it at or the original mortgage? Um, Thank you. It, it, you, you negotiate it at a level that is sustainable for the debtor, whatever that might be. But I think it would be fair to say that if you have bought the loan at a lower amount, there is more room to do a deal because you're not looking at what you lent it out for initially, you're only looking at what you bought it for. So certainly my experience in the past was uh, in those scenarios it's actually easier to do deals. But it does very much depend on a case-by-case -case basis. It's, it's not a hard and fast, fast rule. Um, to go back to uh, the, the other issues around communications, and you're right to say that we, we reference our activities for, for quarter one, um, I think it is important that we do get the message out. It is important that we sort of move up a further level in terms of how we get that message out there, particularly now that we have this new service which is free for debtors. Uh, and I certainly welcome the fact that the programme for government contains a commitment for an information campaign. But we certainly have ideas and plans in place, uh, and were we to receive a budget, we will be able to, to leverage off those to ensure that, that, that debtors are aware of them. We do ha uh, have Sorry, plans for later in the year. You. If your workload doubled, have you the capacity to yes, deal with it? we have the capacity, and that's because we've authorised over 100 and, or approximately 150 personal insolvency practitioners around the country. Some of those are local operators, others are national operators. There's, there's ample capacity in the system and likewise in the court service where there are specialist judges uh, availing of this. And finally, in terms of suggestions around legislative change, um, from a policy perspective, to repeat the point I just made, I think we already go beyond what, what, what is in existence in other common law jurisdictions. Uh, the ISI would not have any fundamental policy changes in mind. We do have a function to contribute to the development of insolvency policy, but we have listed a number of sort of operational uh, tweaks or changes that could be made uh, to the legislation that would make the operation that bit smoother. Uh, and they're with uh, the, the, the Department of Justice and, and they're, they're considering those now. But I think in terms of communication, certainly we will, we will be supportive of a general uh, enhancement to an information campaign to, to ensure that debtors are aware of the solutions that are out there. And finally, the percentage of your 3,000 that the debt was primarily on their uh, on the, yeah. principal residence. Um, I, I think are there difficulties in, in, in ver invariably we, people have more than the one debt so the mortgage probably dwarfs all others by a, a significant margin but <coughs> typically they may have four or five other other debts and quite often the fact that your credit card or your credit union loan is only a few thousand the fact that they are actively pursuing you for payment can mean that uh, unintentionally or otherwise, your mortgage comes under threat simply because you're trying to pay other debts. But what a PIP can do there is 
deal with all of those sort of smaller distractions and focus then on the mortgage. And usually what a PIP can do in those circumstances is then through various tweakings or adjustments to the mortgage make that sustainable. So it is rare that it is a family mortgage and nothing else. Um, but it will always be the, the largest loan by far um, in, in the vast majority of cases. Mr O'Connor. Sorry, uh, to the Chair. I asked earlier on, who actually pays for the PIPs now? Does the state pay for them yeah. through the insolvency? So, so through, the, the through the service, there will be a payment through to PIPs uh, from, from the state as such, but the, the bulk of the, that fee then is paid by the creditor. Um, uh, so the, the banks, through the arrangement, uh, and other creditors would, would fund the PIP. Uh, Mr O'Connor, thank you, and your uh, colleagues, Ms <coughs> Jordan and Mr Warren, thank you very much for your attendance here today. Um, the documentation and your opening statement and the direct answers you've given have been very helpful and useful to the committee. Um, at this stage, we will uh, go into private session for a moment and we'll resume in two or three minutes' time. Thank you. Now in public session. Uh, before we recommence, once again, I'd like to remind colleagues about the mobile phones, either switch them off or turn them to flight mode, and I need to read the note on privilege. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Uh, your opening statements submitted to the committee will be, com will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So I'd like to welcome at this stage uh, the Irish Mortgage Holders Organisation, who are represented today by uh, Mr David Hall and Mr Stephen Curtis. Uh, your documentation has been received and, as I said earlier, will be published on the website. So at this stage, if you'd like to make an opening statement, and then I'll allow colleagues to uh, ask a number of questions at that stage. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. Just to introduce ourselves, um, my name is David Hall, I'm the Chief Executive of the Irish Mortgage Holders Organisation, and with me is Stephen Curtis, who is a personal insolvency practitioner and who heads up our negotiation team. We are a charity. We have uh, 8,500 resolutions in place, keeping people in their homes. We offer a free bankruptcy service. Um, we are regulated and have a personal insolvency practitioner and are regulated to provide all of the insolvency service uh, solutions, as they're called. And we have styled ourselves and organised ourselves as a one-stop shop representing those who are in debt. We have for the last four years been to the fore in advocating for people and assisting those in difficulties uh, who are in mortgage difficulties and facing repossession. This morning I'll be focusing mainly on what I believe is a looming catastrophe and which could lead to the current homelessness crisis becoming significantly worse. To give the committee some context, there are currently 5,241 people in emergency accommodation, 102 rough sleepers, and again, I apologise, most of this you will know more very, very well, but it is important to set the scale because our submission today is on the basis of this being a catastrophe rather than a crisis, and the numbers that are currently before you facing homelessness, and indeed are homeless, will be dwarfed significantly by those that are mortgage arrears in the event they're coming into the system. The scale of the mortgage arrears crisis dwarfs the already chronic crisis. There are currently 33 family homes at risk of repossession and currently in or about to enter the court system. There are currently 20,000 family homes before the courts. These 33,000 homes represent over 2 billion in arrears, but they represent 84% of the entire arrears figure currently outstanding to all lending institutions of 2.4 billion. So 2.01 billion of the 2.4 billion arrears focuses the crisis clearly on this cohort of people who are in arrears of more than two years. In addition, there are also 15,000 investment properties in arrears of more than two years and are at risk of receivers being appointed to these properties daily, and they are being appointed daily, resulting in tenants being evicted. 
These figures also include 13,000 mortgages owned by vultures, which are in arrears of more than two years. Despite the protests of vulture lovers and the Moral Hazard Brigade, the reality is that vulture funds do not offer any long-term restructuring to homes in arrears. They don't refinance, nor do they restructure investment properties, and nor have they long-term aspirations to support the housing policy or the structure in Ireland in any shape or form. Between family homes and investment properties, there are 48,000 mortgages facing either repossession or receivers. At a conservative estimate, this equals to 100,000 people. And I stress, the numbers we're giving you are conservative numbers, they're not exaggerated, they're erring very much on the side of caution. As big as the crisis exists with 5,000 people being homeless, the spectre of a further 100,000, or even a fraction of them, becoming homeless is a human disaster. Most recently, we've been inundated with homeowners and tenants who are in difficulty and who are facing receivers of the threat of being evicted from their homes. Both mortgage holders in difficulty and tenants who are face being evicted, evicted face a stark reality, a dysfunctional rental market that is increasingly unaffordable, or in many cases, it is not possible for tenants and homeowners, homeowners to rent, therefore they're facing homelessness. I'm sure the committee will agree that even 10% of those 48,000 resulting in occupants becoming homeless, the current crisis will be doubled overnight. We believe that radical thinking and radical action is now required. The previous Oireachtas, in its form, guaranteed the liabilities of insolvent banks, providing £64 billion in funding. We believe a number of suggestions and hope that the committee will take some radical approach to protecting citizens as they had taken to protect banks. On the second page, as members will see, we outline a number of suggested approaches that we take. And we're willing to go through those, obviously, over the course of this uh, session. You know, homelessness itself is a massive issue. If the physical upheaval of losing one's home is horrific. However, along with homelessness, there's a huge mental health issue. Those in debt and facing homelessness silently suffer with significant mental health problems. And in a recent survey, which we conducted with Dr Eddie Murphy, those in debt who are facing homelessness, 20% of them indicated that over the previous four weeks to conducting the survey, they had considered and had planned, had planned to take their own lives. The challenge facing this committee in resolving this problem could not be more stark. From the Irish mortgage holders perspective, we give you a full commitment of our cooperation, support, help in any shape or form that can be given uh, to you in that task. And just finally to say, the previous body and Larkin and the guys who are an excellent uh, team of people and the legislation was established under the insolvency service in the context of having over 100,000 properties at risk of repossession and having four cohorts of people in arrears, nearly in arrears, in long-term arrears and those hanging on by the skin of their teeth. And I know a number of the deputies and it, it's, it's, a funny, it's a funny prospect to watch a previous uh, organisation chairman come in where you have exceptionally knowledgeable, knowledgeable and intelligent questions being asked and we joked outside and said I might do the opening remarks and let Stephen do the answers uh, which would be far more comfortable but one of the key questions and, and Deputy Coppinger asked the question of the scale of this problem the insolvency service with the greatest respect to it has resolved 0.085% of mortgages in difficulty it has resolved only 1,000 but the other aspect that's very very important it doesn't determine which of those are buy to let properties and doesn't determine which of those are family homes it is 1,000 combined in addition, the statistics from their own report, only published, state 4,000 people applied to the insolvency service, but only 2,000 of those got deals, the extra 1,000 are bankruptcies. So 50% success rate in getting through a very convoluted, complicated process. It is mentioned in the programme for government, and I hope it's adhered to. That process needs to be upended. And just finally, Chairman, this is a crisis. This is a potential catastrophe, and I met Peter Father, Father McVary on Friday and respectfully said to him, you think 5,200 is a problem. It's nothing as to what's coming unless radical steps are taken to prevent that. Thank you, Mr Hall, but you're not finished, if you don't mind, for one moment. Before you take <laughs> questions, I'm, no, I'm, I'm quite serious. You actually said you had a number of recommendations mm -hmm. that they're here. It might be useful to the committee if you just gave a brief yeah. summary of those, and then we'll take the questions, Perfect. if you don't mind. No problem. So, in the programme government, there is a family home should not be unnecessarily repossessed and alternative solutions should be provided. And this refers specifically to the Code of Conduct of Mortgage Arrears. And the Code of Conduct of Mortgage Arrears should be and must be put on a statutory footing. And these combined solutions in and of themselves will only tip off the crisis that exists. 
but it must be put on a statutory footing. The Code of Conduct is a voluntary code. It is not a statutory code. It must, and I know uh, Deputy Collins uh, brought before the House last December, 12 months, a very simple piece of legislation. And I know the landscape has changed radically now and may be better received now, but it is absolutely incumbent upon this committee and this House to ensure that vulnerable people who face mortgage arrears and are face eviction have at least two solutions available to them that are compelled to be provided, which, to be fair, many of the mainstream banks do provide. And it's incumbent that the, the Code of Conduct be put on a statutory footing and that if mortgage to rent and a split mortgage, at a minimum, be a minimum solution offered by every single lender in the state prior to throwing someone out on the street. If politicians are serious about protecting those facing an uncertain future, as they need to draft appropriate legislation for compulsory purchase of properties and lands to protect citizens. And I know uh, the Master was in discussing in relation to vulture funds and taking those properties. We own two state-owned banks. A phone call to those two state-owned banks tomorrow morning will give an answer that's yet to be disclosed by the central bank. How many customers in mortgage arrears have they got financial information on which they can confirm are going to lose their homes? By our calculations, the figure is about 7,500. And on top of the cohort we mentioned earlier on, those lenders also know how many of the restructuring arrangements they have that are vulnerable. Those restructuring arrangements have been pulled out of circulation and removed from an at-risk register. As far as we're concerned, a significant percentage of those are at risk and they need to be dealt with. We can take those loans. Those loans can be taken over. We own two state-owned banks. This is an, and this will require emergency stuff, not anyone thinking... They're crazy stuff. This is genuine stuff that needs to be taken on board. Those two banks should be here tomorrow morning. How many loans have you got that you have evaluated cannot pay? These are people who have cooperated. And the far more serious question of those who are before the courts, the perception of those before the courts is someone's a messer. Someone's trying to pull a stroke. And that suits the banking narrative. The question that should be asked of those banks who have got people before the courts, how many have submitted financial information and how many of those people that you initiated legal proceedings against in the full knowledge they're goosed? And that's a very serious barometer of those who are before the courts. Currently, the state pays those who can't afford rent, a form of rent allowance. This is a significant economic burden on the state, and the state gets no return for this money. We proposed a fair mortgage solution, and we circulated this, where there's a major cohort of people who simply can't pay. There's a further cohort of people who can pay something, but not enough that satisfies the, the criteria set by the central bank. Central bank are the ones who are the ultimate court to the banks. They set the sustainability arrangements in relation to mortgages. So Mary and Joe, who could pay 500 euros, where the mortgage is 1,000 euros, may not satisfy the central bank's requirements for sustainability. And if Mary and Joe, bizarrely, get 200 euros from Uncle Sean, unless Mary and Joe can satisfy that that's full-time permanent income, that doesn't count. However, if Mary and Joe were to lose their home, all of us and the entire country pay maybe €650 Euros for Mary and Joe in rent allowance. Why not take 200 or 300 of that, top up the €500 Euros and leave them in their home? And if the council wants to wake up one morning and become very clever and take ownership of that home, let them. But let's have some economic benefit to keeping those families in their homes, in their community, by using the existing structures that are in place. And if Mary and the banks, and they don't say this very often, the banks have actually propped up this system for the last four years. The banks have paid de facto the rent allowance that should be paid by the local authorities for these people that hasn't yet hit. Because we have a cumbersome, slow, crap, thankfully, system of repossession. And that's the only grace that has saved this is its dysfunctional system. Currently citizens own we own two banks, and as I say, we should bring those banks in, we should identify and start with those cohort of people. There are citizens, there are banks, we need to know what numbers they are. Finally, we have NAMA, this big monstrosity of an organisation that seems to prefer a more elite cohort of debtors, which makes those type of debtors appear a bit better than ordinary citizens who are in debt. Bizarrely, they have a very good skill set. We chose, and legislation should be introduced at this late stage to ensure that NAMA uses the skill sets of those debtors it has before it favours them to keep their family home, before it favours them to pay them anymore, before it favours them to write off their debt. They, all of those should happen only when they supervise a successful project of building houses on NAMA-owned land. 
Then and only then should those people be released from their debts, should they be allowed off scot-free. Very few of our clients are stuck in €2 million Euro homes being paid ten grand a month and having €100 million Euro debt. There is inequality, there is a major imbalance, and now is the time to correct that imbalance before we have one of the biggest catastrophes of all time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hall. Uh, I'll take a number of contributions and I'd remind colleagues again if, to keep the questions direct um, as we have a, a full committee here this morning. Uh, Deputy Quinlevin. Firstly, thanks to David for the presentation. I think it was very interesting. I think you came up with some simple and practical solutions there that, that should be implemented pretty much straight away. <coughs> I was taken by your, by your comments there that 20% of those, the survey you done recently, 20% of those had mental health problems and a, lot, and a huge number of them were contemplating um, taking their own life in the last four weeks of when that survey was done. Obviously, we're all dealing with problems with people who present themselves to our constituency offices. I've never done a constituency clinic without somebody coming in in mortgage distress and it's a massive, massive problem. A number of um, meetings ago the head of the housing agency was here and he basically said that we urged the committee to, to get the government to give it its highest priority to address this issue and it's, it's, it is a massive issue. The central bank said there's 80, 88,292 people in mortgage arrears and that was in the first quarter of this year. Um, four families a day are now repossessed or, 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 or surrendering their houses and the number of people in mortgage arrears doubled under the last government and non-bank lenders now hold almost 46 mortgage accounts for principal do housing dwellings and buy to let combined. So let's, we have a massive problem with that. Just, uh, David, what would your simple solution be to the, the mortgage to rent um, process that we have? It seems it doesn't seem to work that well. You know, there's, there's this, how would you speed it up? And what would, what would you do to make sure that people in mortgage distress can, can access that as fast as possible? Thank you. I'll take one or two more, if you don't mind. Deputy Durkin. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, and, and uh, thank uh, Mr. Hall for coming before the committee. Can I, can I just ask, you, you put forward the solution that the state should intervene uh, because the state owns the, uh, a number of the banks and that the state should subsidise the system uh, by way of entering the marketplace and, uh, and either writing down mortgages or paying the mortgage uh, in the same way as rent support. Can I ask the extent to which you have evaluated the cost to the state that that might, that, that, that might be as a result of that. And do you differentiate between those who, who are tr paying, trying to pay, and uh, making no effort to pay? Uh, what, how many of the, the totality of the mortgages and arrears that you have dealt with or that you're aware of, do you see uh, those uh, who are not paying because they cannot pay uh, with, and, and are re trying to, and those who are paying within, the, with, within their means, to the best of their ability, and recognising that roughly one third of the disposable income in the household is deemed to be eligible for payment of a mortgage, there or thereabouts. The other two questions, Chairman, are the, the, the uh, extent to which uh, those who refuse to pay anything are, uh, how many of those people are in existence? And, and do you support that they should also be supported in the context of any support from uh, this state? And the last question is in relation to the moral responsibility that lending institutions might have uh, towards borrowers to whom they lent in the, in the past five or seven or eight years, uh, who are now being uh, pursued by the same lending institutions on the basis that their, their loans are unsustainable. Uh, to what extent do you see a moral obligation on the part of the, le of, of the lenders to in some way carry some responsibility and carry some of the burden for their uh, uh, badly advised uh, lending? Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Harty. Thank you. Uh, David, in your opening remarks you said that you had 8,500 resolutions already. Are they resolutions which have been arranged between the, the borrower and the bank excluding a PIP or are they negotiated via a PIP? Because those figures are much greater than the insolvency agency figures. Are you working a different method or what's the difference between the two um, arrangements that you have and the insolvency arrangements have? Thank you, Deputy. Mr Hall or Mr Curtis? Take I, I, I'm going to take the easy ones <laughs> and then hand over the more difficult ones to Stephen. So in relation to the Messrs, Deputy Durkin, as far as we would be concerned, there's 5% as our experience in relation to people who are messing. The simple solution to those is they should just be nuked. 
None of us have time, effort, inclination to, in any shape or form, deal with those people. The numbers of people who are in difficulty. And just to set the scene, the, on the Irish Examiner last Saturday mentioned that MABs have 1,440 clients currently in mortgage arrears. We have currently just 1,950 clients in mortgage arrears. Where is everybody else? So we have no time for anyone who wants to try and pull a stroke and mess, nuke them, deal with them in a separate forum. But for those who are in difficulty and distress, there needs to be some solution. And, and, and moving on to mortgage rent, uh, Deborah Kuhneman. Mortgage rent conceptually was a great idea. It had two components under the Keane report in October 2010. One was that it would, and many of us, including ourselves, balked at the idea of a bank becoming a landlord, coupled with a bank versus a vulture becoming a landlord. I know which one I'd pick today. Mortgage rent is a great idea, horrifically constructed. Now, if you wanted to complicate something and find the sickest person in the country to try and complicate something, you couldn't do a better job than mortgage rent. And one of our clients, Danny, who, who, who we have just today or yesterday, hopefully we just finished off a mortgage rent deal for him, where the lender refused to conduct mortgage rent. And Danny's unfortunately wife passed away. But he's three young kids, absolutely perfectly so, so eligible for mortgage rent. Lender decided we don't do mortgage rent. We took a high court case in February, and Justice White ruled against us, saying mortgage rent is a voluntary proposal and solution. So with him, to answer your question, what should have happened is, Everyone in the country could have seen that Danny was eligible for mortgage rent. Danny should have had mortgage rent within one hour. We did an analysis of how long it's taken us to deal with Danny. We've 210 emails, 73 phone calls, 16 meetings, over 80 hours. This is for one person with three young children who's already had a personal tragedy with his wife dead. And only now, 18 months later, will mortgage rent be get across the line. So, to answer your question, there needs to be a body that can sit and deal with Danny in one hour, which compels the borrower and, and the lender to comply with its decision in the best interest of the borrower and the state, because the numbers are enormous. And Danny is coupled, by our calculations, by 20,000. It would take 276 years for the insolvency service to get through this, as well intended in the world as they might be. Now, the cost, I'm going to hand over to Stephen for the money. <laughs> Stephen loves money. I, I think I'll, I'll just start with, um, I think, going back to your point in relation to the people that can't, can't pay and those that won't pay, and something that we have um, suggested for a number of years now is that anyone that's going into court or anyone that's going into, um, into negotiations with the bank, a very, very simple thing that you could do is you could introduce that the PIPs could administer it, or whoever you want to administer it, would be some sort of a cert, cert of affordability, which would say, this person is paying X. This is all they can afford to pay, or they can pay, afford to pay more, or they can't afford to pay anything, as the case may be. Because our experience would be that the vast majority of people that come to us, they're, all, they're either paying as much as they can, or they're paying more than they can, and forgoing other things, like not paying their electricity bills, not, not paying for groceries, all of that type of stuff. And I think that, that would be one very, very simple way of determining that. The, the reality is, of having dealt with this for the last, I've been doing this for three years with David, and doing, doing it for longer elsewhere. The, the reality of dealing with this is the vast, vast majority of people pay as much as they physically can, because the consequences are that they lose their house, and people want to cooperate as much as they can. In terms of the in terms of the, our figures versus um, the insolvency service figures, obviously they're they're significantly higher. So obviously we're not doing them through the insolvency service um, mechanism. The majority of them have been through through informal negotiations. And our experience, I'm a PIP, I'm reg registered and licensed with the insolvency service, so I don't want to insult them too much. But the reality is the is the uh, operation of the insolvency service for the types of organisations or the types of people that we're dealing with is far too cumbersome. Um, and I, I, I can't remember who asked it in the last session, but someone asked, how does I think it was um, Deputy Collins asked, how does how does the PIP get paid? The reality is, for an insolvency arrangement to happen, there needs to be a pot of money brought to the table by the debtor. That's where the PIP gets paid out of. They don't the debtor doesn't necessarily write a cheque to the PIP, but the PIP gets paid out of that pot. It goes sort of circumvented through the creditors and back to the, back to the PIP. And in order for insolvency arrangements to work on a wholesale scale, it requires money. We've, we've long said that, that actually one way of dealing with that would be PIPs are private operators. It's a private practice. Most of them are accountants or solicitors operating in a private practice. And that if you wanted insolvency arrangements to be done on a wholesale basis without a requirement for a profit to be made, 
because that's effectively being a PIP is a business without the requirement for a profit to be made. There should be public PIPs. There should be PIPs licensed by the insolvency service, run by the insolvency service, that go to the people that say, well, actually, you could probably do a deal, but you can't fund paying for a PIP to go and do it for you. So we have five or ten or twenty PIPs or whatever amount of them working for us. Go to one of them. They'll implement it for you. In terms of the cost of the, uh, our, our proposal in, uh, in relation to rental lands, so this is money, and, and in some ways it's, it's quite hard to judge, because there's an, there's an amount of people that the banks, uh, the banks are taking repossession proceedings against them. There's about 20,000 of them before the courts at the moment. And effectively those people, a lot of them will be eligible for social housing if and when their houses got repossessed. And there's going to be a cost to the state there that ranges from about sort of 650 a month to up to about 1,900 or more, depending on what county you're in. Um, if you take that by about... Our estimate would be that there's 20,000 people at imminent risk of that happening. So, you know, 500 by 20,000 is the is the amount. The the reality is we don't know at the moment because the, there's nobody paying it. The, they're effectively sitting there not paying the banks because they can't, and they're not being subsidised by the housing authority because they're still in their properties. If you wanted to really solve the problem uh, with mortgage to rent, what you'd do is you'd go to the two state-owned banks, AIB and Permanent GSB, and say how many of these. Uh, people that you're currently taking to court, have you gone and looked at and said, you can't pay anything, you're going to be eligible for social housing, you're going to go into that system if and when we repossess your house. And, when, and, and get the, the two lenders to put a list together of all of those properties and go to the approved housing bodies and go to the Cluids and the Oakleys and say to them, lads, here's the houses that are available. Make us an offer and we'll buy them and leave those people in their houses and let them stay there instead of this charade of them going through the court system where they will eventually get properties get repossessed unless something happens. Yes, as David says, it's a very, very slow process, and thank God for that. But unless you're going to do something radical in relation to that, we've spent two full working weeks on one case, and it's only solved now, and we've been out of for 18 months. And that's not a way that you're going to resolve this in totality. And just in addition, where, where many are before the courts, uh, Deputy Durkin, the cost of being before the courts comes to the debtor eventually, but ultimately the people who are goosed, it comes to the bank. So all of the costs associated with entering a legal process, a legal queue, and you know the average cost of, of, of repossession varies. But the banks will tell you, the Irish Banking Federation in a recent meeting with us told us that of all the long-term arrears cases, 50% are paying nothing. So you know, the real question is, in, in an emergency and in a crisis, you need to get into those numbers very quickly. Make, and I, I was at a flat conference a couple of years ago, and I'll never forget this guy who stood up, and I know Paul Joyce is in later on, and, and Paul will give you a lot more documents than we give you. But this man stood up and said, well, not everyone's going to get equal treatment here. This is a crisis. Not everybody will get equal treatment. I'm sorry. Uh, because the, the scale and numbers are so big. If you take the numbers that are there, and, and take any uh, number of information, get treatment in relation to being solved is a very, very difficult thing. The numbers that are involved, the speed at which this needs, to administer 20,000 people before the courts, and in any normal uh, system, those 20,000 should be rechanneled through a new body who has the authority to engage with both parties in a very swift, meaningful, quick resolution way. To administer those people without having hundreds and hundreds of staff to do so will take a long time and some people unfortunately will lose out. But it doesn't take a long time if a general principle is established and adopted and the point that I was raising there is what about the moral responsibility on the lenders who gave so freely, uh, so readily to so many, with, almost unconditionally? Should there not be some recognition on their part, and I'm differentiating now between those who refuse to pay anything at all on the basis that everybody can pay some little amount, some small amount, is, is within the reaches of everybody. If people are on social welfare, they have to pay local authority rent and so on and so forth. So the, the, I, I want to try to get an answer to that question, if I could at all, uh, Mr Chairman. I, 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 the, the, the moral responsibility on the lender to, 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 to look up forward and look backwards at the same time and say, look, we, we granted this loan in good faith. Was it in good faith? Or was it in the clear knowledge that they were going to repossess at a later stage? Thank you, Deputy. I, I, I smile when I hear the word moral and a lender in the same sentence. No, I, I think you need, you need, Nick, you know, for the last seven years, you know, we talk about vulture funds, like vultures eat on carcasses which are dead. We have current lenders and vultures who are eating on, on people who are alive. 
That's a, like if you you've dealt. I know you've dealt, uh, Deputy Dirk, with many uh, people in your constituency. I'm with many courts I know you've been. Times. I know you have. I know you have. And likewise, I've been doing this for the last five years, in and out. And I've met every lender in the state face to face. Some don't allow me into the bank. Some I meet in coffee shops. I've seen them. Moral doesn't come into it. This is a production line. These are people, and things have moved. The time to hit them with the moral argument was 2008, 9, 10, and 11. They've moved on. No. They have moved on in staff, they've moved on in ethos, they've moved on. I'm not agreeing with it, but I'm no. saying it is horrific. It is like walking through a swamp in a pair of wellies trying to deal with them and trying to get them to understand the, compa the, the compassion. Yeah, how can you have a system that has a, a dialing system? So this is the system that the banks use as a dialer. That Johnny gets rung by Mary today, gets rung by John tomorrow. The code of conduct in July 2013 was evaporated to allow them ring any number of times they want. Do site visits. And they call them field officers. They think they're the FBI. They knock on your door and say, hello, you owe us 200 grand. How are you fixed? So the entire consumer protection component of this has been abandoned, and respectfully, and I say this respectfully, by the entire establishment, by the central bank, which is the greatest joke of consumer protection in the history of the state, and should never be inside the same walls as the central bank. And respectfully, this committee now, I believe, is an opportunity to change all of that. There needs to be legislative basis for consumer protection that every bank and lender in the state understands clearly and those sitting in armchairs in America you will not throw someone out of a house here unnecessarily if someone's being reasonable and can contribute towards the mortgage and that is where we need to move to in a very fast industrial scale basis Mr Hall Deputy Coppinger um, Thanks Chair uh, I think if you examine the way that people in mortgage distress have been treated in this country in the last you know, eight years since the crash. You, I, well, I wonder what you, you think, but just the, the unfairness of it is just mind-boggling. And if anything shows how this system cares nothing for the majority in society, it's the fact that so little has been done, in my view, by the previous government um, to help people. This was one of the key issues, I'm sure you remember, in elections like a few years ago. And apart from the PIP service, which we saw, which has not been taken up by many people. Um, so just a, a few questions that specifically. Um, just about the vulture funds, and I was interested that you mentioned, despite the protestations of the vulture lovers, vulture funds don't have a long-term interest in settling with people in distress. So I think we'd be fair to say you're at... Are you then in disagreement with the Minister for Finance? Because when he came in here and sat in that chair two weeks ago, he made an analogy with vulture funds where he said that uh, vultures provide a very good service in the ecology through cleaning up dead animals that are littered across the landscape. And he's met them on several occasions, as has his department. So do you agree that it was wrong to sell so many mortgages to vulture funds, that the government shouldn't have allowed that to happen? Um, and we can only assume from the Minister's comments that he sees uh, he's likening mortgage holders and people in distress to dead animals that need to be cleared off their landscape because, uh, as you said, unfortunately people are very much alive. It's a bit of an insult to vultures because they actually do perform an important function in ecology. But um, I think the other point you made is that radical action was taken by the Oireachtas in dealing with the banking crisis and £64 billion was passed over to deal with this. I just wanted to ask you, where did that 64 billion go? Did any of it go to releasing the debt on mortgage holders, or did it all go to releasing debts on developers and the banks? Uh, do you have any figures on that? For example, the AIB wrote off 5.4 billion in construction and property loans in the last two years, compared to only 1.1 billion on residential mortgages. That's owner occupier and buy to lets. Um, just in terms of CPOs, I'm, I'm glad that you did raise that because I think um, legislation is needed in that regard. Would you advocate as well that the state should do that, obviously for mortgages in distress, but could it also be used by the state-owned banks where possible to write down people's mortgages? Um, at the end of uh, 2015, AIB had $5.7 billion in impaired residential mortgages. But they wrote down, as I said in the previous question, 5.4 in construction and property loans. What if they'd used that, you know, to write down the debts on the mortgage holder rather than writing down 
the developers' debts. Um, just the, the other thing is, uh, would you agree that there's been a conscious policy by the government, and I've, I don't have time to give all the examples, but I've loads of examples of statements, to allow property prices rise in order to, you know, say, to, to, to release uh, or to bring down negative equity on people so people will feel better about their debt? But would you agree that that has led to the housing crisis as well? Because if you're sitting waiting for prices to rise, you know, obviously you hold back land, you hold back houses, and um, you contribute to the housing and homeless crisis. Um, lastly, I, I, I think in the interest of people knowing where you're coming from, I, I have to ask you about your relationship with AIB, because um, the Irish Mortgage Holders Association um, has a connection with AIB now um, since... I think it's 2013. Uh, so could you outline the nature of that relationship so people are aware of it? Um, in AIB's annual report last year, they said to the year end 2015, 2,370 customers achieved a resolution with the AIB through your organisation, with 779 achieved during 2015. Your website says it's funded by grant aid from the AIB. Um, so how much do you get paid by AIB? Are you essentially a contractor for AIB? And um, obviously you've been able to take on staff as a result of that arrangement. Um, and the reason I ask is, does, does that not compromise you when you're dealing with AIB? Um, because they are one of the biggest mortgage holders in the country. I think Mr. Hall, I'll take one or two others because, and I know there were some specifics there. Deputy Collins. Yeah, um, thanks for coming in. Um, I, could I just say that I have had dealings with the Irish Mortgage Holders um, Organisation, as has many other TDs in this room and previous government have had um, in relation to both probably themselves and uh, clients and, and, and constituencies that have come in over this issue. Um, and, and, the, and I, I just want to register again that I fully endorse the fact that we're in a, a housing crisis, a housing emergency, and we still have a tsunami coming down the road in relation to repossessions, evictions, if we don't deal with the issues that have been raised here today. And um, I would take cognizance of many the points that are made by um, David Hall and um, the Irish Mortgage Holders Organisation, because they're, they're dealing with every single day you're dealing with the issues that have confronted you, and very complicated issues, and I know some of those cases have gone forward to you to try and deal with and try and resolve with the banks, and you've come, you're really at the cold face of trying to understand the workings of the banks and all that and how they, they process, and can I, can I just ask you, um, the, the code of conduct is still voluntary, and I think one of the first things that this committee can do is ensure that it becomes legal, that the banks are forced to um, address split mortgages and um, uh, mortgage to rent as part of the, um, the resolution because they still have the opportunity to not accept them and I think that's um, it's not going to solve the problem but it's an important part of the, of, of the issue um, and just in relation to the PTSB and AIB um, that proposal there of looking at exactly where the banks have their stress mortgages um, looking at each case and then putting forward that idea um, to the um, uh, CLUID, the voluntary housing organisations, local authorities, and having a practical way of doing it. Because I think what Edmund Holden, and it struck me what he said the other day, was that we need a... What was it, what was it he said? We need a... Uh, can you all remember? <laughs> um, well, the point he was making that we, we need to deal with it very, very quickly, very bluntly, and, and move on this. It's, it, it just can't wait. He, he sort of said we need a, bl a blanket um, inter intervention into it to try and, and try and deal with the issue, and I think that's the case. And I think that would be part of that process that would help in relation to that, um, of dealing with those banks. Thank you, Deputy Collins. Deputy Canny. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks very much for coming in. Um, I suppose you've described how the distressed mortgages... Uh, the whole charade around trying to get things going, how complicated everything is. Um, and you mentioned about the agency or a court that would actually do a quick bullet point um, decision on things that would be binding. But you talk about AIB and you talk about um, 
can Bank of Ireland and the vulture funds be brought be made accountable to that agency or that court or whatever as well, so that we don't end up solving some of the problems and not solving others. And I suppose I think it was uh, Deputy Coppinger that raised the issue about. I feel myself that what's happening at the moment is that the banks are waiting for the. Um, value of these houses to go up. So that may be why the process of possessions is slow. They're waiting until they get to a place where they can actually repossess at a time when they get most of the money back rather than doing it this year, wait till next year, whatever. Is, is, would that be your view, that they're just stringing it out and let the mortgage holder who's in distress suffer uh, the, the mental uh, strain of all of these debtors coming at them every couple of weeks, threatening or whatever it is, but still leaving it to a stage until the value gets to, uh, of the property gets to a certain stage where they can sell it off, get the money back, and, and hump off with the, the mortgage or your, I, it's, it's just an observation I have, and I have a concern about it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Kenny. Mr. Hall, Mr. Curtis. Could I just, just to deal with the last point uh, Deputy Kenny made, because uh, Deputy Coventry made it as well, the central banks quarterly report gives details of how many properties they take possession of each quarter and they sell on each quarter. And every single quarter since 2009, the figures have shown that there's 1,000 properties available and being held by the banks. So in, in response to your question, I would 100% agree that there's nothing sure in the world than that the system has preferred the banks, has preferred the increase in property prices. It has undoubtedly been an intended uh, project. Why else in a housing crisis where mortgage brokers are looking for properties on behalf of customers would you intentionally hold every quarter a thousand properties that you have in your books? Why would you do it? Mr. Hall. Yeah, they're all in the possession. They've been either given voluntary possession or repossession. Every quarter, if you look at it, the same line, it fluctuates between 920 and 1,020. It's exactly the same every time. There's no other purpose in the world other than controlling the market. Nothing sure in the world. And they've always held those properties on their books. Same number each time they repossess 179 or 240 per quarter, they sell 230, but they always keep 1,000. In any other rational thinking environment, those 1,000 would be gone. They'd be given to a local authority, they'd be sold to a local authority, they'd be offered up as housing, they'd be made good in the event that some of them are not uh, up to standard, but you would deal with them instantly. And that's not been done. So I, I, would, I would share your concern um, in relation to that, and I have nothing, you know, it's very, very strange when somebody is evaluating. This comes back to the very key question. If you evaluate someone's financial circumstances and you determine they're in grave financial difficulty, and many people in the country have, say, a buy to let property as well as a family home, the only purpose for doing a deal with the person to hold on to the buy to let is for you to take rent while the property price increases. It is unclear for that person who owns a buy to let property what that bank is going to do with them in 12 months, 24 months, or any time. And you know, Deputy Durkin, we would say to people that there should be no surrendering of property until such time as the residual debt is dealt with. And if that means not paying the 300 euros that you may be able to afford to pay, if a bank brings you to court and requires you to pay 1300 and you can only pay 300, questions have to be asked as to why would you pay the 300. And that's I disagree if you're refusing to pay anything until the oil is sold, that puts you in a weak position going to court. The, well, the and, and that we may differ, but the reality is the league law states, as is categorically the case, and only a handful of cases have failed to get repossession orders, a repossession order over time will be granted, and with the current housing, housing crisis, somebody may be better served holding the 300 euros for a deposit in this mad rental uh, stage that we're in. But ultimately, the buy-to-let properties, where somebody has a family home mortgage and an investment property, one or two investment properties, and they're being, the rent is being taken, and only the rent is being taken, and many of the banks actually have a formula that they will tell you minus what percentage of rent they will accept, but there's no certainty or long-term plan for those people, and that's a great danger. Just in relation to a couple of um, points, uh, Deputy Coppinger, in relation to vulture funds first, I would agree with you 100%. I had a conversation face-to-face -face with Minister Noonan on Bank Holiday Monday. Uh, where I gave views in relation to mortgage arrears and solutions with the Independent Alliance and, and uh, had a very robust exchange and that conversation took place between myself and Minister Noonan where it was very, very clear that Minister Noonan falls into the vulture lover category and uh, he was very clear on his love for vultures. Uh, we had a very robust exchange in relation to it and um, you know, the, some would argue there is a place. If you were a business, and the part of the problem is, if you are goosed and are going to lose your property, 
there is a quite, quite likelihood that the vulture fund will write off your debt, but in return they'll want your keys. And one of them is offering €5,000 if you get out of the house within six weeks at the moment. That's their intent. It's very clear. They're self-confessed predators. They circulate for five years. They suck at acid dry and they move on. The bigger concern, clearly my biggest concern, my big concern is that you end up having a super vulture where the current vultures suck what they can and sell on to the super vulture. And that's a major concern. So I, I agree with you in relation to the comments. I think Minister Noonan is ill-advised. I think his preference to have met, and I said this to him, to have met vulture funds versus debtor advocates over the last five years was deeply concerning. Um, however, I will say in his defence, I met a man last Monday fortnight who clearly knew the system doesn't work and was exceptionally engaged in a number of days in trying to bring in some stuff. Let's see if they get brought in. But I would strongly urge this committee, and as Deputy Collins has said, the mortgage to rent um, and split mortgages being part of the Code of Conduct would be one of the recommendations in there. The court being centralised, but having an arm of that court that can push through deals, so you have a, a push through deals, would be highly recommended. But as I say, I saw a different reaction. Yes, the vulture part was there, but I did see a different reaction at Deputy Coppinger. Just in relation to our own arrangement with AIB, so with, co with people who are in debt, people who are in debt either afford services themselves or, as is the process throughout Europe, the, the polluter pays. We went for 18 months trying to deal with banks on behalf of debtors on a voluntary basis, and all of our staff were done on a voluntary basis, and it was impossible to deal with the likes of Danny over a two-year period taking two full weeks to get one case across the line in the absence of having staff. We were doing an injustice to those people. We made an approach to AIB and we asked them to fund a number of staff who would engage in relation to doing deals. They did that for the first year, which was a huge success. We're up to over 3,500 deals with those customers for the last number of years. Um, the last year they paid us about €680,000. We hired staff. It is done on a grant basis. We're a charity. It's not done under a service level agreement. It's not done under a contract. But to answer your question and give you some comfort, Apart from asking AIB, which the Finance Committee asked them and your colleague um, um, asked them, Joe asked them the same question and they gave a very robust response, I would safely say that since October last year that we, having reported all of the banks, including AIB, to the Central Bank, supported by the Oireachtas Committee on Finance in relation to track and mortgage issue, we will probably cost AIB €200 million Euros because of that letter. So our issues in relation to our debtor advocacy is 100% clear, 100% solid. I know when I go to bed tonight that there are a number of thousands of people that my team have helped keep in their beds. And I make no apologies for seeking, and we also get 120 grand off KBC, I make no apologies for taking money off them, because they should be paying for it. It goes back to Deputy Durkin's perspective in relation to uh, the morality of this. They should be funding it. They should be funding these services. It is their obligation to fund these services, not pursue people, but to make sure that there's best protection that's in place. And I guarantee you, Deputy Coppinger, if you ask AIB, uh, would I be a friend or foe, I think you'll get a very, very clear message. But I respect the question and it's the right question to ask. Chairman, there was a reference made to the, the fact that the Minister for Finance was a, a, a vulture fund uh, lover and I object to that and I want to correct it. Uh, the Minister has given no indication to that effect at all. Uh, the minister, the minister has, the minister has, has what the minister has said, uh, in initially and and more recently, that uh, uh, what are called vulture or venture capitalists have been of benefit when, at a time when there was little money circulating in the system here, and 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 it was it, it for for that purpose, that purpose only. As time passes, and it should be recognised now by everybody. Uh, for, for, for whatever reasons, uh, we should not come to a conclusion uh, that in any way uh, besmirches the reputation of somebody who is not here, but who can defend himself and quite clearly has done so in the past. Thank you, the committee isn't making any decision on that. We're at this point in time taking um, uh, submissions and we're questioning witnesses. Uh, Deputy, I'm conscious. Yeah, I, Have you, just, Deputy, uh, Deputy, can just, I just no, no, please, one moment, sorry. please. It Deputy, was Deputy the same Byrne had, had indicated. I know, but uh, Deputy please, Durkin made a please, point. Please, and there's please, lots of evidence that the Minister please, has a very please, positive attitude. That's a matter that the Committee can deal with yeah, separately. At but the I'm moment, just giving the corollary of what he said. It's Deputy Catherine Byrne, he met please. Him eight times. I, I just want to support Deputy Durkin and what he said. I think it's wrong, and anybody can come in here, make accusations 
decisions about an individual, whether a minister or a deputy. And in your open statement, as all, all committees, you clearly identify with people that people are not here to defend themselves. Their names should not be used. And I'm just disappointed that Mr Hall has decided to use this opportunity on live television to make a statement about a minister. I think it's wrong and he should be withdrawn. Sorry, you he didn't make a statement. I asked him a question. Did he agree? No. You're, you're obviously political because you're in Fine Gael, but the minister said it himself sitting on that chair. Deputy, so it's Deputy, 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 Deputy Coppinger, Deputy Durkin, uh, Mr Hall uh, and Mr Curtis are here to answer questions. Mm. Um, the committee has made no findings. We, yeah. will we in no, due yeah. course, will, will, will go yeah. through our own deliberations. Can be left in the ether. No, can be left hanging. No, and I want, I, want to state, I want to state quite categorically, Chairman, I reserve the right to object at any, at any such intervention. You can I'm object. I'm but I can object to you me, as well. Deputy uh, Durkin, Deputy, Deputy Coppinger, I am moving on. Okay. But, Chairman, we shouldn't be trying to gag people when they come in here. Gag anybody. No, we should gag anybody. That's very but I, 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 wish to, I wish to make it quite clear that it is my right mm. to challenge any issue, uh, issue that arises here, whether for political purposes or otherwise. Now done, but I still want to con Good. conclude. And I want to record I, it. I want to, con I want to conclude the meeting because uh, we have a session again this afternoon. Deputy Cowan, please. Thanks for your contributions, David. Um, you know, I, know, I know you've said, obviously, and many people agree with you, that the mortgage to rent had the potential to be a reasonably good scheme and to address the difficulties existed for many people. But unfortunately, the way in which it's been administered and the administration around it leaves a lot to be desired. And I hear what you're saying in relation to the contributions you've made towards the uh, provision of a programme for government, and you would hope to see improvements in that regard. But notwithstanding the, the time that it may take for that to uh, bear fruit, do you believe that um, emergency legislation could be uh, brought to, to the House with a view to protecting those tenants whom are caught in the middle of the mortgage to let situation, um, you know, those properties are being repossessed and that there's a, a, a new sort of swathe of those now being, being, being brought to, to the courts and many people who find that their rights are nil and void, really, uh, and, and are completely at the behest of the, of, of the courts and unfortunately the legislation does not protect them. And do you believe, or has it been suggested, by anybody you've been dealing with in recent times, that there could be protective legislation brought forward for them to allow them to remain in those homes for a period until which the mortgage to rent to let situation has been rectified. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Mr.